This is a Hot Pie Original. So I read this, it may have been a couple nights ago, found this interesting. And now in light of what has happened here in Texas, in light of what has happened in Florida as well, and that is the governors of both states drawing the hard line saying, no mandates, none, zero, forget it, not a chance, no way. Now you have mayors of big cities in both Texas and in Florida saying, you know what, I dare you, come write me a $1,000 ticket. The timing of what I read from this law professor is interesting to say the least. Her argument, and I'm going to let her just make the argument, the rest of you can do with it whatever you want. The argument is interesting to say the least. I, she can answer whether or not it goes there. Uh, I want to make sure I get your name right. She's a professor of law at the UC Hastings College of Law. The title of the piece at Barron's, Barron's is a financial publication, is Make Unvaccinated People Pay If They Harm Others. Um, Dorit, is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, okay, so Professor, uh, I'll call you Professor. And I do, I, this is, it's really, really interesting read. So I'm just going to set it up for you and you make the compelling argument. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe you find a way your piece and your red light, running a red light comparison, which is pretty interesting in light of what is happening now with the governor saying no mandates. And now you have cities saying, okay, really write me some tickets. Go ahead. I dare you. So make the argument that unvaccinated people are the equivalent to the red light runner. So in many contexts, we say, if you choose to do something that imposes risk on others, and if you choose to do something where the risk benefit balances more risk than benefits, you can do that. We won't put you in jail. We won't uh, even fine you. But if someone gets hurt because you made that the bad choice, you have to pay them. Now, red light is a bit of a tricky argument because it's also against traffic laws and you can get fined for it. But for example, if you do a bonfire in your yard and don't take care of it, and the bonfire gets out of control and hurts your neighbor, you're going to have to pay for that. Why, what's the difference here? If you choose not to vaccinate, you're rejecting most of the expert's opinion. You're choosing to leave yourself at risk of a virus where extensive evidence shows that the risks of the virus are much bigger than the risks of the vaccine, and you're risking others. You can do that. But if someone gets hurt, why should they pay and not you? Okay. It, are you saying this is just sort of following, connecting the dots and law, the way the law works everywhere else? Or are you saying here's a way to fix the unvaccinated problem? What, 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 is, what is the overall premise and the goal of, of doing this? And I don't know, maybe you can answer. Are people, are people now starting to sue someone else over COVID? Not, not yet that I've seen. So okay. I think the, if we see lawsuits about COVID, the first lawsuits are going to be, for example, a lawsuit against your employer who didn't take precautions against uh, COVID, uh, against the nursing home facility that didn't require that their, that their staff be vaccinated. I think those are going to be the first. But if your family members ends up on a ventilator because you're... Um, because your neighbor didn't vaccinate and your family member is immune compromised and the vaccines don't work for them. First, you're stuck with a lot of costs. You're looking for coverage. Second, it's fair to make the other person pay. In terms, you're raising, would this prevent unvaccinated? And I think it may have some effect on the margin, but it won't solve the problem of non-vaccination for two reasons. First, people who, many of the people who don't vaccinate don't really believe it's going to happen. They don't think they're going to uh, get very sick themselves, and they probably aren't imagining that they'll, they'll hurt someone else. I'm giving these people the credit, and I think it's it's right that they don't think they really are doing something that puts others at risk, even if they are. So they're not going to figure, factor that in because they're not. They don't think it's going to happen. Just like we don't think when we get in the car at three a.m. and we're exhausted that we're too tired to drive and we'll get into an accident. So I don't think it will have a huge impact. It may have an impact in the margin, but it will provide compensation, hopefully, to at least some of the people that are hurt by this bad choice not to vaccinate. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm sure other than people, with all due respect, making lawyer jokes and ambulance chaser jokes, um, Professor, somebody runs a red light. Somebody, no, we'll forget that one. Your example, if somebody, my neighbor starts a fire, if, you know, they're, whatever, they're cooking hot dogs in the backyard. Next thing you know, my fence is on fire. They're clearly at fault. 
I know yes. who set my fence on fire. I don't know many people that could make a compelling and maybe correct me, make a good enough argument. You know where I got COVID? My neighbor Bob over there. He coughed in my face. That's it, Bob. Uh, I'm hiring the professor. We're going to sue you. So there's two parts here. Uh, first of all, you're completely right. There are going to be cases where we don't know who caused the accident. Remember that uh, you don't always know who started the fire. Fire is in the forest. Sometimes you know who you can trace it to, but not always. And if you can't, you're going to have a problem. But there are cases where you can show uh, where the COVID came from. The, uh, the outbreak started in the nursing home. You can probably point to the staff or if neighbor Bob is the only person outside your family you're interacting with, you may be able to point to neighbor Bob. Uh, the other part is you don't have to show it with an absolute degree of certainty to win the court. You have to make a case that it's more than 50% likely that it was in fact Bob. You can do it, for example, by saying Bob was the only one that coughed in my face and the only other places I went to where everybody was masked, it's a lot more likely that Bob was my source. You won't always be able to make that case, but sometimes you will be. Okay. Well, and damage, I mean, the damages are clear. If, if, if I end up sick, I get that the damage is there. I don't end up sick or I'm, tell me how, tell me how a case, how you envision a case playing out. And I Good. assume so in, the the very near, in the very near future. So you're right. If you don't get sick, you don't have a case. Just as if someone ran a red light but didn't hit you, you don't really have a case. Yeah. Um, the biggest hurdle to this is actually a strange legal hurdle, uh, which is called duty. Under the law, before you have any claim against someone for behaving negligently, you have to show that they had a duty to you. For example, if I'm sitting and drinking a big hot chocolate and I see a baby crawl into a puddle, and I keep sitting and watch the baby drown, I may be really morally culpable, but there isn't going to be a legal case against me because I don't have a duty to act for the benefit of others. So you can say, if you're not vaccinating, you're just not acting. You're just outside on the side as a bystander. And that's going to be the really big hurdle here. And there's several ways that this can be overcome. One is you can say it's not that you were unvaccinated, it's that you went into a place unvaccinated without a mask and coughed in people's face. I like your uh, Uncle Bob example. Okay. Uh, neighbor Bob example. <laughs> you can so, change the name. It's fine. But you get, you get the idea. Yes. So you, you go into a place and you cough in people's face when, without a mask when you're unvaccinated. You're acting. So we're no longer in the bystander. Second, you can say... Today, to avoid vaccination, you already have to take action. You're not just a bystander anymore. You're actively avoiding being vaccinated. Third, we do make exceptions. We, ha we have cases where uh, we still impose liability on people who didn't act because the social policy behind it is so strong. Uh, for example, if a doctor doesn't warn someone that they have an infectious disease and that person infects another one, the doctor might be liable. So duty is a really big challenge. The other challenge is, can we convince people that not vaccinating was unreasonable? In areas where the vaccination rates are low, you can say, well, everybody else didn't vaccinate. Maybe there are good reasons not to vaccinate. Maybe it's reasonable. Uh, you'd have to convince a jury that uh, not vaccinating is unreasonable. And I would point out that having a person who ended up on a ventilator of it is going to probably have a bit of an influence there too. But, but you would have to make that case. It's never easy to get through a tort case. Uh, and then, as you said, you'd have to show who caused the infection it, that to convince people that it's more than 50% likely that it was in fact neighbor Bob that got you infected. Uh, and you would have to show damages, with, uh, which as you pointed out, in the right case wouldn't be an issue. So, it's not going to be an easy case in, in many cases, but in the right case, it's doable. And again, we're ending up with a question. If you ended up with a large hospital bill because you ended up on a ventilator because of someone unvaccinated, why should you pay? Yeah, right. And then for people to go, well, you have insurance, of course, raising the cost raises the cost of everyone. I mean, these, these, you know, all costs are passed along is the argument about insurance. You know, oh, yeah, sure, who cares? Insurance pays, but that'll drive up the cost of insurance. So the, is the more, is the more I'm not going to say it's impractical because it's really an interesting argument. 
it, it's sort of surprising that that hasn't happened yet. And that is, it seems as if, Professor, at risk would be businesses and institutions. Um, you, you go to McDonald's. I mean, I, 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 go, I go to McDonald's and I have a breakthrough case. And McDonald's in down the road in Austin, Texas, or wherever, hasn't imposed vaccines and or a, mac, a mask ban. And so I, I sort of I, I hire you and I say, look, uh, counselor, I, I've only been to three places. I go to McDonald's every day, so surely it must have been McDonald's. And they don't even have a policy there. So I think it stands to reason that I might, I just might have, as you said, 50 percent. There's a pretty good chance I got, I got COVID there. So, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't represent anyone oh, there. Okay, okay. However, okay. You're, you're, however, you're rightly saying, uh, can can it be done? And and I think one of the there's two big reasons we may not have seen this yet. First of all, the, the pandemic is moving extremely fast. The vaccines have only been uh, authorized since December. It feels really fast, but if someone's uh, spent two months in the hospital since December, that I mean, it, it, it's not a lot of time and it takes time to build a lawsuit. That's why statutes of limitation for, so for such lawsuits are usually two to three years. So first of all, the timing, uh, if something's going on, we won't see it. Second, most the reality is that in most contexts, most people that have a potential tort claim never go to the court system because it's not easy to bring such a claim. You need to find a lawyer, you need to get the evidence together, and you need a case that has at least a uh, going chance. Uh, so I, I expect we will at some point see some lawsuits on this, but uh, I'm not surprised that we haven't yet. Right. Well, I mean, your arguments at some level are pretty reasonable, a uh, cruise line, an airline. I mean, don't they know that? sooner or later these suits are coming and that sooner or later some of them just by sheer numbers might have merit so if i if i'm running that mcdonald's i'm either going to go find a way to get to the governor of texas or florida and say either you need to impose a mask a vax mandate we got to do something because i'm running real liability here because before long half a dozen of the regular customers are going to say my business was at fault I hope I'm not taking it too much out, but I don't know if you're aware that there's already a cruise ship, uh, a cruise line uh, in Florida that's uh, suing the governor yes. and the state of Florida for the uh, man for the law that prohibits vaccine mandates. Exactly, not exactly under the liability grounds, but under the grounds that this prevents them from operating safely and runs them into trouble. It makes perfect sense, security. though. I mean, their argument makes yeah. perfect sense. Exactly what I said. I don't want to go and run the risk of a thousand people saying they got COVID here. And I've got to pay the lawyers and the insurance and everything else. I'm just not going to exactly operate. That. Exactly. And that's the other thing. If it's a big operation like a cruise ship or a concert venue, etc., it doesn't even have to be a, a claim that will win in court to impose real costs on the business. Uh, one of the things that happened with the tobacco litigation is that most of these claims never ended in a successful verdict against tobacco companies. But they were so big, tobacco companies settled a lot of them. Yeah, in that case, though, it w I mean, they could e they could probably even argue better. Hey, you should have known this one. I, I, yes. Someone's going to be able to come back and say you should not have pushed that ship away from that dock or you shouldn't have thrown open that coffee shop doors. So what is the I know businesses would say, well, if I don't open the doors and take this risk that I might get sued, I'm going to go under anyway. Yep. Yes, exactly right. And that's, by the way, what the cruise ships are saying. They're saying you're giving the, the CDC is telling us not to operate unsafely and we may end up closing again. You're telling us you can't operate safely. We're in the middle. Yeah, we can't we can't do both. Is my defense, though, uh, whether it's McDonald's or any business, I, you know, I know most of what your arg your argument was was about the neighbor, Bob, I guess. But. Is my defense when I think you're saying when people sue? It's not a matter of if; it's yes. just when. Correct? Yes. Okay. Is this going to be a big deal? Is this going to be kind of a tie? Is this going to be cigarette litigation like? It depends. Uh, 
it depends on where we see the big outbreaks and uh, if, if we see for example an outbreak that can be directly linked to a concert where there was no mask mandate and no vaccine mandate then it could be litigation style uh, other than that it's probably going to be smaller although plaintiffs can get together from different directions one of the barriers is in Texas and Florida is going to be in places that would love to have a mask mandate but can't because of the government they you can't really sue them because they don't have a lot of choice yeah um, that was going to be my question so a group of people get together they blame my store my restaurant and then my defense is, well, I would, I would have loved to make sure that everyone had the vaccine, but I'm not allowed by my state. So you, you got nothing here. That's a very strong defense, because if, if your state doesn't allow you, you have a problem. And one of the problems here is that it's going to be almost impossible to sue the state in torts on this. Because so um, historically, you couldn't sue government at all. It's called sovereign immunity. Government was above uh, being sued in tort. All states and the federal government have now a torts claim act that allows you to sue them in some circumstances, but all, as far as I know, also have an exception for policy decision. So if they made a policy decision not to allow masks or vaccine mandates, you can't really sue them in torts. You can try and challenge them on other grounds, constitutional, legal, say the decision is unreasonable, but you don't really have a good tort option there. So give everyone an idea of if you were the crystal ball, three months, six months, how long before we start hearing and seeing these and give us an idea of who it is, whether they win or not, I guess we'll see, but give us an idea of who it is that is going to be sued. Like what would this, what would these lawsuits look like and when will they take form? This is completely speculative, but here are two examples of really strong lawsuits. So we know that, for example, in Texas, we know that the, ma the, man the government legislation doesn't prohibit, for example, hospitals from mandating that employees uh, be vaccinated, etc. So and, and a, a strong suit would be, for example, a nursing home that chose not to mandate the vaccine. A staff member went into the community, brought Delta into the nursing home, and two or three residents... Uh, tragically lost their life and their families are suing uh, saying you should have required the employees to bring a case another option um, a, 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 either a pub or a, a, a big arena having a concert a large packed concert with no mask requirements no uh, vaccine requirements in entry and people in there get COVID uh, either they or family members die and the claim is you you uh, and it will be stronger, by the way, for the family members, because the people who went there are going to face an argument that says you chose to be there. You knew there was no vaccine mandates. You knew there were no mask mandates. That doesn't apply to family members. The family members didn't choose to be there. So uh, you'll you'll see, for example, a family member bringing a case saying you chose to have this event without anything, any protection. I got COVID. I've been in the hospital for three weeks on a ventilator and I still have lasting harms. So that's going to be this, probably the strongest case. And I would say that I expect to see one or more of those in the next six months. Okay. Your perfect example here in Austin, Texas, within two months of now, there'll be a couple hundred thousand people in a park, not far from where I'm sitting in a studio right now at a giant music festival. If you are the city of Austin, the state of Texas, the music promoters, the acts themselves, what kind of conversation needs to be taking place and what kind of reducing risk policy could you really implement? So I, I'm hesitant a little bit because I'm not – the, the uh, laws I've seen from Texas are, are a prohibition uh, on – business from requiring vaccines right um, but not masks I'm, I'm and I'm a little nervous because masks isn't my area and I may have missed a mask yeah, law. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> if you can't require vaccines 
you want ideally to per- give people the option to show social distance. You're outside, so that helps. But you want to encourage people to social distance. You want to maybe enforce it even on groups uh, to social distance if it's practical, which it might not be. And you want strong mask requirements in a situation like this. Uh, you may want to offer a online option or a separate or um, uh, a separate vulnerable people kind of a safe area even if you can't uh, require vaccines generally you may be able for example to set out an area and say this is for vulnerable people for people who are for example immune compromised and concerned and we're going to have those seats apart from each other and we're going to require that in the vulnerable area we only have people who are either vaccinated or medically exempt that's not a general requirement that's not you have to be vaccinated to watch the concert so those are some things yeah that so is if is. if i if i'm yeah. the city if i'm the music promoter am am i going to be covered if i say hey look i warned you i said don't come to this music festival unless you have a vaccine i'd love to check to make sure but i can't so we told you don't come here unless you're vaccinated somebody does anyway even if it's a breakthrough case then the, their grandfather gets sick and dies. Are they going to come back and say, look what you, uh, look what you did? And then my argument's going to be, but I warned you not to come here if you weren't vaccinated. What, what, what's my real defense going to be? Just that I warned you? So first of all, you can have people sign a waiver. I, I'm sure you, like me, you signed a waiver for all kinds of sport exercise and gyms. Yeah. And the waiver will bind the person, but not the family members. So you can have people sign a waiver that says, I realize I'm taking this and this risk. I accept the risk on myself. If I get sick, I don't do that. But waivers will apply to the people who sign them, not to other people. The other thing you can potentially do is have an indemnity clause. I realize that I'm taking the risk of infecting someone else. Uh, I promise to pay you, the organizer, any tort uh, costs that you end up uh, bearing if that happens and you get sued. Obviously, that won't always be enforceable because a lot of private individuals won't have the money to indemnify. And if I a large yeah. judgment, but that but that would be some kind of coverage. So you buy a ticket to a concert; it it has a COVID warning on it. Sort of, like, I mean, it's, and that's, is this like the equivalent? It's a weird example. Is this the equivalent of I go to a baseball game and I get hit in the head with a foul ball? I don't really have a case because that's I agreed to take the risk. Uh, it, it's it's uh, close. So. Stop me if this gets too technical, but okay. we have two types of p- people assuming the risk, agreeing to take the risk on themselves uh, in, t- in, in the law. One is where, as you said, you go to a baseball game, you, you are agreeing to take some of the risk of watching a baseball game, including being head- hit in the head by a baseball ball, ball just by going there. You don't have to sign anything explicit on that. Uh, And that's one thing you can say if you chose to go to this concert and the concert venue is going to make that argument, you accepted the risk of being uh, infected by COVID just by going. If they wanted to be on stronger ground, they would also have you sign a liability waiver, just as, for example, your gym has you signed the liability waiver, because the liability waiver can also co- cover cases where they were negligent. And it's not just an inherent risk of the situation. Uh, so they're likely to do a little bit of both. Have you signed when you buy the ticket a, a waiver that says I, ex- I accept liability? It's a, it's separate, I think. This uh, interesting battle just before you came on, I was already talking about this, and that is the cities now, particularly we're having heavy outbreaks in Florida and in Texas, where 35% of the new cases are in Florida and Texas. The governors have doubled and tripled down on saying you're not. No, you're not having there's not going to be any mandate anywhere, anytime. Uh, executive order after executive order after executive order. Now you have cities and now schools saying, Give, who gets fines? The, I, I mean, we, we've only heard like we're just now learning about this. So it'd be a thousand dollar fine. And I'm a school district. And I said, you know what? We're going to have masks. So yes. the governors now they're on. They're basically on the clock to start imposing these fines. What does that look like? So. There's two parts to this. Uh, First of all, as you're saying, it might make sense for these cities and schools to say, we'd rather have the fine than have the COVID. 
Uh, and then the governors are going to be in the dilemma of, do I actually enforce this? Do I follow through and penalize these places for trying to keep the people in my state safe? Or do I not? Maybe they'll end up making one or two examples and let everybody else slide. Maybe they won't. But the other thing is, uh, another question is, how do the cities and schools enforce this? Schools can enforce this by not letting students in. And then what will happen is the parents will probably sue the school, go to court and say, you can't do that. It's illegal under the governor's order. Right. And a court might order the school to let the child in with potential of contempt penalties for people who don't let the child in. So it's not as clear cut that it's just the fine. The, um, schools and cities, if they try to enforce this, might face their own litigation. We, but it makes a lot of sense that they will try to push back and where it will really be fought out is probably in the political arena. As they push back, there's going to be political pressure on the government probably from both sides. Well, yeah, I'm even curious about if they, if understanding political optics the way they are in Texas and Florida, I want to look tough. I want to follow through on my mandate. So, I'm, I mean, the, who gets the ticket? The mayor? The, the principal? Every kid that walks in the door? I mean, how far out do fines go and to whom? Good. So, so not the kids, because wearing a mask is legal. Requiring a mask isn't. So right. the person wearing the mask isn't doing anything illegal. It's the people who are requiring them. So the principal potentially is a school district and the, any teachers that are involved in enforcement. And that could cause a dilemma, by the way, for the schools. If the principal wants everybody masked, but the teachers are either too scared to enforce it because they don't, uh, they can't afford the fines or don't want to enforce it because they disagree, there may be enforcement problems inside the school. It will still increase mass scoring, by the way, even with little enforcement. If the school says we expect everyone to mask, some people will mask. Though, as you point out, in the poli current political environment, there are people that are going to make a point of not masking their kids and sending them anyway. Yeah. So... Well, I guess via Zoom, you've got one of the best law schools in the country. Are you t are students asking? Or are you telling them, "Hey, look, you know where the next cottage industry is? You want to know where the next the next big round of lawsuits is? It's uh, you know, become an expert on COVID law because it's coming your way over the next two to five years." I try not to tell my students uh, how to run their career. <laughs> uh, a lot of them are interested right now in public health and a lot of them have questions on how can I, what can I do to make it better? We're also in California. So um, they're probably looking more local for their fights. Yeah. Uh, I doubt they'll be going to Texas to, to have that fight, but I know from friends in Texas, there are people there that are looking to uh, do something. I mean, people who have young children and are worried about them getting Delta, uh, people who have immune compromised people in their house are extremely scared right now in Texas. And uh, to be honest, they're right to be scared. Uh, it's It looks like things are bad and it doesn't look like there's anything in place uh, to improve things quickly enough when the lawsuits happen are we are we are we looking at big tobacco like settlements i mean are we are we looking at giant numbers here probably not if it's lawsuits against the schools and the governor uh, among other things they're not big tobacco they they don't have yeah. the same earning and cap and uh, payment capacity um, and the people suing uh, won't necessarily have hopefully they won't have the same severe harms as uh, smoking victims, which when we're talking about millions of people with very severe cancer, we can hope that that's more limited. And at least some of the people harmed by COVID are going to be people who chose not to vaccinate. And the question of self-harm, as you, you mentioned that that's true for, for tobacco as well, and you're completely right. Uh, but we're still, it, it still does weaken the case. Okay. Well, it's a good read. It's a, it's a, it's an unfortunate reality, the issue itself. Uh, the, it's in Barron's. I, maybe the, maybe the, the piece is elsewhere. Uh, Professor Dorit Rees, am I getting that correct? Rice. Rice, okay. okay. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for um, – it's, 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 fa it's fascinating. It's unfortunately fascinating, but it's a fa fascinating topic. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and I hope you all stay safe. Okay.
Uh, the title of the piece, for those that haven't seen it yet, I, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting and terrifying read. Make unvaccinated people pay if they harm others. John McClellan is the co-founder and creator of ATX Hot Sauce, now in all 50 states and several retail outlets as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to let this social media rock star chef uh, walk us through four different sauces, and then I'll taste and we'll tell everyone why they should buy. You can give the science behind yeah. these, and then I'll make the uh, the simple recommendation. Go to atxhotsauce.com. All right, so let's go. I don't so think anybody's go. heard the website. Yeah, I know. I know. You, Jeff, I've but never heard that. Yeah, it is atxhotsauce.com. I'll say it 345 right. times, atxhotsauce.com. So let's do it. Uh, I brought four flavors here, and we're going to test your palate today. Okay. And I only brought four because I didn't think you could handle five yeah, or six. Yes, Probably a smart move. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the first one we're going to try here, it's called Beet Heat. And just like the name implies, beet. It, beet, it has beets in it. It's made with red Fresno peppers. Red Fresnos are uh, red peppers that are uh, they're hotter than a jalapeno and a little bit less than a serrano. So not super hot here. Uh, just a lot of good, really good flavor. So we're going to start All with right. this one, and then we're going to move up the chain. Okay. I've had the beet heat, but okay. Yeah, we're going to try it, though. We're it, goes try it, well, it goes well with a cab. All right, Jeff's savoring beet I'll heat. even do it with you, so that should be all right. Now, remember, it is hot sauce. Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's hot sauce. Trust me, man. Wait, that one's, is that one hot to you? Um, No, no, no. A little. Yeah. The, no. the great thing with the fermentation process is you get a bunch of the flavor right up front. Yeah. And then the heat comes, but then it dissipates pretty quickly, especially with the red Fresnos. You know, this is not a very spicy... Uh, one, but it is um, a very tasty one. Goes on great on sandwiches. Beet heat. Beet heat. B e e t heat. All right. Go to atxhotsauce.com. That's right. Uh, you want to know how there's two worlds we live in? Here you go. This is vaccinated, not just vaccinated versus unvaccinated. This is what vaccinated people think versus what unvaccinated people think, and it's as opposite as you could imagine. 80% of vaccinated Americans, this is from Forbes.com, 80% of vaccinated Americans pin the rise in COVID-19 cases and the new spread of variants on the unvaccinated. You don't say, <laughs> really, why is that number only 80%? Where else is this coming from? So 80% of vaccinated say the new rise in COVID cases is the unvaccinated. Also, vaccinated people consider Donald Trump 36%, conservative media 33%, foreign travelers 30%, and Americans traveling abroad 25% as key contributors to the rising cases. Uh, okay, I, I don't know why the number is 80%. Now, the blame from the unvaccinated. Those that are unvaccinated were asked the same question. Why this increase? What percentage do you think say me? Mm, zero. Yeah. A significant number of people who hadn't been vaccinated blame. Get ready for it in order. <laughs> Foreign travelers, mainstream media, and Americans traveling internationally, 23%. Far fewer unvaccinated people blame Donald Trump, 11%. I can't believe that number is even 11%. Conservative media, 7.5%. Joe Biden, 21%. The CDC, 19%. And public health officials, 18%. So all those people on that list, that's whose fault it is. Man, that's messed up. Nowhere in there is the answer, me. Nowhere in the answer is me. Well, all we're asking is a pretty simple question. Why is there now a new spread? And nowhere in there is the answer, me. <laughs> You're unvaccinated. It actually is you. No, nope, not me. That would be Fauci, media, media, Fauci, Fauci, media. Oh, yeah, foreigners, too. And you and you think we're going to solve you think we're going to solve this problem. Exactly. How do you communicate with that person from the hot pie media studios in Austin, Texas? It's the Jeff Ward Show. Listen at JeffWardShow.com.